Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the team Calcutta Comparatives 1919, I take this privilege to warmly welcome you to the 58th lecture of our lecture series. Calcutta Comparatives 1919 is an independent forum for research scholars of humanities and social sciences. It carries the legacy of academic study of Indian languages and literatures envisioned by Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee and introduced in the year 1919 at the University of Calcutta. Later in 2005, a new department called Comparative Indian Languages and Literatures was established, which still continues to carry research in Indian languages. Calcutta Comparatives 1919 took inspiration from this history. and it is a platform for sharing research interests and ideas we are organizing online lectures on various interdisciplinary topics to be delivered by academicians and distinguished research scholars of different fields your remarkable skills will be a great addition to our team we look forward to a mutually beneficial relationship with you thank you for joining us today now i would like to request our host jemima nasrin to introduce the speaker jemima uh thank you so much suparna uh, i feel immense uh, uh am i audible yes you are yeah thank you so much suparna uh, i feel immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker Shubham Datta is currently an assistant uh, professor of English at Gokhale Memorial Girls College. He is a research scholar of Vishu Bharati University. He completed his post graduation from Vishu Bharati University. Apart from Sri Aurobindo and Tagore, he fosters keen interest in cinema, culture studies, cricket, and food. Today, he will be talking about the prisoners as the pilgrim, the ideology of of spirituality in Sri Aurobindo's Korko Kahini. Uh, I welcome you, uh, Shubh Mr. Shubham Datto, to our forum. Thank you for kindly agreeing to uh, give a lecture in our forum. Now you may begin your lecture, uh, Shubham Da. Um, is there any network issue? uh i think he is facing some network issue um uh our speaker is facing some network issue uh he is rejoining soon uh sorry to our audience for this inconvenience we will start shortly once he joins Okay, ha has he rejoined? Um, Devima. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, ma. Ha has he rejoined? Yes, he's here. Okay. Uh, I welcome you, uh, Shubhamda, to our forum. 
uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So you may begin your lecture now. Uh, is my screen visible to everyone? Is my screen visible? Uh, not yet. Hello? Uh, not yet. But uh, my uh, screen... Yes, yes. Pratimda, can, can you please yes. make this screen visible? Is it visible now? Am I audible yes. to you, all of you? Yes, you are audible. Uh, are audible. Just uh, wait a second. Okay, okay. And uh, before uh, before the screen gets visible, let me tell you about my topic. My topic is uh, the prisoner as still grief, ideology of spirituality in Sri Aurobindo's Karakani. So, uh, I have been researching on Sri Aurobindo since 2015 at Vishwarabhi. And uh, I am vastly indebted to Professor Gautam Goshar and Professor Amrit Shen for uh, introducing me to this wide field of Sri Aurobindo, this vast field of Sri Aurobindo. I knew nothing of Sri Aurobindo before 2015. So, I dedicate this lecture to them. Uh, the topic of this lecture is the prisoner as a pilgrim, ideology of spirituality in Sri Aurobindo's Karakai. Often I confront this question, uh, why Sri Aurobindo? The answer that I give is why not Sri Aurobindo? Sri Aurobindo because Sri Aurobindo as a thinker is vastly misunderstood. Either he is tagged as, uh, as a Hindu nationalist or he is tagged as a spiritual yogi. But both these aspects, both this definition, both this categorization essentially miss one point. The point about Sri Aurobindo the human being, Sri Aurobindo the politician and Sri Aurobindo uh, uh, the thinker who defines an alternative view of politics, alternative notion of politics, a politics of alterity uh, that we say in our uh, post-structuralist term. So this, uh, I would like to uh, excavate how this politics of alterity is operative in Sri Aurobindo's Karakani. Uh, as you all know that Sri Aurobindo was arrested in the Alipur bomb case in 1908. And after uh, he was in prison for 12 months in the Alipur court, Uh, we are again facing some network issue. Uh, Shubhamda, you are not audible. Uh, uh, Shubhamda, you are not audible. Uh, Jema, I think we lost uh, connection again. With yes, wait, I will just call him. <laughs> Uh, just ask him if you can uh, just uh, turn his camera off and speak. That will be also. Mm. 
I'm sorry, participants, uh, uh, for the inconvenience. Our speaker will join us shortly. Please stay with us. Um, soon, they will be here with very soon. Uh, he is joining us again and I have asked him to uh, turn his camera off. I hope uh, the network will uh, be better in that way. Uh, I apologize to our participants for uh, facing such network issue. But these things happen and we have to accept it. Uh, so so uh, just wait for a few minutes for our speaker to join. Thank you. Uh, pardon me for my internet connection. It's a little bit of uh, erratic today. Oh, so uh, perhaps I got disconnected again. And please give me my little more. How did I get disconnected? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 From the yes, uh, your screen is visible now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, uh, uh, should I begin from the scratch again, or uh... yes, you okay, may. Yes, I'm beginning from the uh, beginning again. So, uh, the topic of my lecture is the prisoner as a pilgrim: ideology of spirituality in Sri Aurobindo's Karakani. Uh, I am a research scholar of the Department of English Ritual Hierarchy and an assistant professor of Vocal Memory at Girls College. And I have been researching on Sri Aurobindo since 2015. And, uh, um, and I am indebted to Professor Gautam Ghoshal and Professor Amit Chen for introducing me to this vast uh, world of Sri Aurobindo. I knew nothing of it before 2015, before doing my, uh, before doing my PhD on it. Almost nothing of it. So uh, thank you to them and I dedicate my lecture to them. And uh, the question that I often uh, encounter that why Sri Aurobindo? The answer that I give that why not Sri Aurobindo? Because uh, Sri Aurobindo as a thinker is vastly misunderstood. Either he is tagged as a spiritual guru or a revolutionary Philippian who is a Hindu nationalist. But both these aspects of Sri Aurobindo vastly misread uh, the nuances of Sri Aurobindo's critical and political thinking. And uh, in this uh, in this uh, lecture, I would like to argue that how in Karakahini, he uh, develops a, a, politi a politics of alterity against the biopolitical tool of the colonial theory. So uh, this is the premise of my lecture, and with this I begin my lecture. So Karakahini, uh, as we all know that Sri Aurobindo was arrested uh, in the Alipur bomb case in, 2000, uh, in uh, 1908, and uh, after uh, being involved in the Shadeshi movement, and uh, in, uh, he he uh, he was arrested in 1908, and he was he spent uh, 12 months uh, in the prison, and he came out of the prison uh, in 1909, and he writes Karakahine in 1910. So Karakahine returns from prison life is a memoir by Sri Aurobindo. Here he recounts the brutish experience he undergoes in the colonial prison after being imprisoned due to his involvement in the Alipur bomb case in 1908. In Karakahini, 
Sri Aurobindo locates a stringent critique of the uh, colonial system of justice and prison system. Also, the text quite persistently seeks to engage with a new vision of ethical justice, retaining the autonomy of being. The text is a retrospective account of his suffering in a claustrophobic prison space. However, quite paradoxically, he calls his suffering in the prison as pilgrimage. So, uh, uh, pilgrimage, uh, the idea of pilgrimage becomes our ashram, becomes central uh, to Sri Aurobindo's poetics in Karakahin, Ayodhya. So, these are my research questions. Why the carceral space is being redeployed as a space of pilgrimage by Sri Aurobindo? How is pilgrimage related to a definition of autonomy and selfhood? And what role does the reminiscence of account of Karakahini play in translating Sri Aurobindo's politics? These are my research questions. Uh, uh, let me uh, give you a brief timeline of Sri Aurobindo. Sri Aurobindo was born in Calcutta uh, in 1872 uh, near Shakespeare's Sorony. He went to England at the age of seven in 1879, experienced hardship in England, which generated an innate colonial sentiment, anti-colonial sentiment in young Aurobindo. So uh, as his biographers uh, show that his life in, life in England was not very, uh, not very prim and proper. He had to face a lot of hardships and vicissitudes in his life in England. Uh, particularly in his adolescence. Uh, he got associated with a revolutionary group, group called Lotus and Dagger, which was committed to the mission of India's independence. He came back to India in 1893 at the age of 21. He started writing as a polemicist in uh, the Indu Prakash, published his uh, first literary collection, Songs to Mahila, in 1897, which uh, obviously is a collection of romantic poetry. And he was highly influenced by British romantic poetry. I am researching on Sri Aurobindo's plays, and I show that uh, how there is an interconnection between uh, British romanticism and uh, Indian spirituality in Sri Aurobindo's plays. Uh, the poems express an arduous longing for the motherland. Obviously, uh, like Michael Mohishudan, there is a longing uh, for motherland in Sri Aurobindo's poems. In 1905, uh, Bhavani Mandir, and in Bhavani Mandir, he conceptualizes the nation as a spiritual entity, nation as Shakti, as mother. So uh, he extends the uh, tradition already uh, already uh, propounded or already started by uh, Bonkin Chandro in Anandamot uh, about worshipping the nation as a mother figure. And 1905 in Bhavani Mandir, uh, you find the rearticulation of that, uh, of that sentiment of reading the nation as mother. In 1906, uh, there is a launch of the uh, periodical Bande Matra, and he, here he endorsed his views on Purna Swaraj and boycott. That in, 19, uh, in 1906, Sri Aurobindo officially begins his career as a politician, as a political activist. Before that, his career was mainly confined to the domain of literature, cultural, cultural politics, and so on. He was not very much focusing on the theoretical aspect of politics or the practical aspects of politics. He was just uh, uh, concerned with uh, uh, concerned with writing the political text, different political, literary, cultural activism. In 1906, he joined active politics, and in, in 1908, he got detained for the Alipur bomb case. Sri Aurobindo and the British colonial administration, in his essays. New lamps for the old, Sri Aurobindo gently critiques the colonial system. He also critiques the old Congress policy and uh, uh, advocates a departure from its modus operandi. So, from new lamps for the old, there is a tendency in Sri Aurobindo to critique the colonial system, to critique the British colonial system, and uh, uh, on, on the contrary, he is espousing a different kind of a political system which is based on French ideology. So from England, there is a departure, uh, 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 there is a departure towards French system of ideology, French system of thought in Sri Aurobindo. His critique of materialism remains directly linked to his critique of colonial modernity and its dehumanizing tentacles. I will explain this later. Going beyond the laws of Western materialism and its dehumanizing impact on the individual, 
Sri Aurobindo endorses a politics of alterity. Is that the, the argument of my thesis? Is how this politics of alterity is, uh, is present in this text Karakahini. How this politics of alterity informs uh, Sri Aurobindo's text Karakahini. In the in Bande Mataram, he, his trust remains predominantly on the development uh, uh, of a new national iconography. So, uh, as I uh, talked about that, uh, his quest for nation was something else. His quest for nation was not the uh, the derivative discourse as Parthi Sattar defined it. Uh, it's not the uh, uh, system of uh, material uh, uh, materially grounded uh, uh, system of nation uh, as we know of it. Or he is not reading the nation as a political entity. Rather, his conceptualization of nation is very much spiritual, and he is uh, conceptualizing. He is imagining a spiritually bound space rather than a politically bound space. So his uh, trust is predominantly spiritual. However, spirituality shapes his politics. So the the aspect of spirituality and the aspect of the political are not. Separated in Sri Aurobindo, they, co they commingle, they interpenetrate. In his iconography, nation is rendered as a spiritual, sorry, nation is rendered as a spiritually bound political entity. The conceptualization of nation as a spiritually uh, bound political entity intrinsically related to the cultural politics of his time. As uh, Bipin Chandra Paul and uh, Lala Lajpat Rai, uh, Bal Ganga Dutt, you know, all were uh, conceptualizing the nation. As uh, uh, as mother, and there was also a tendency to read about the spiritual future of man. That uh, the man is a very transcendental individual, and man is capable of uh, overcoming the barriers imposed on him. So this idea of uh, uh, spiritualization of man, the spiritual uh, spiritual aspect of man, remained intrinsic to Sri Aurobindo's philosophy as well, and uh, and it was uh, part of the contemporary literary and cultural discourse as well, uh, as we talked about uh, Bunkin Chandra Chatterjee, and also there was Bipin Chandra Pal, uh, Sri Aurobindo. In uh, Bande Mataram, he develops his quest for an evolutionary being who emerges from the uh, crucible of the contemporary politics and is capable of reasserting an autonomy of selfhood beyond the tentacles, sorry, a pardon for the spelling mistake, tentacles of colonial modernity. Uh, the quest for an evolutionary being remains central to Sri Aurobindo's epistemology. The quest for an alternative mode of politics automatically rendered to be one of the dangerous men of India. So Sri Aurobindo, in the eyes of the British colonial administration, was the danger was one of the most dangerous men in India because Sri Aurobindo was English educated. Sri Aurobindo knew uh, how to critique the colonial policy, and Sri Aurobindo exposed the colonial policy in his text like uh, New Lamps for the Old or in Bande Mataram. So uh, this uh, this uh, critique of the colonial system uh, uh, automatically made him a bit annoyer of the British colonial system. So uh, uh, he was uh, not he was not at all in the good book of the British colonial. He was tagged as a revolutionary and later on he will be arrested on this charge on this uh, on this thing. So Sri Aurobindo's critique of uh, 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 critique of the British sense of justice uh, uh, in New Lamps for the Old, he writes, uh, men who preferred action to long speeches and appealed by only methods available in the famous epoch, not to the British sense of justice, but to their certain uh, to their own sense of manhood, are not at all the sort of people we have uh, either the will or the power to imitate. So uh, he is uh, clearly, uh, clearly uh, striking at the root of this question of imitation that was taking place at that point of time, and uh, uh, he rather advocates an alternative. The quest for the alternative remains intrinsic to Sri Aurobindo's politics from the very outset. So he is uh, going beyond the imitative uh, view of politics, and rather he is endorsing a different sort of politics, which is not at all imitative, rather which is. Uh, uh, which is original, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, emanates from the indigenous soil of India. Well, uh, then let us return to our own orderly and eloquent era. Uh, the, uh, the faith in British justice has crumbled into the dust. Nothing can again restore it. Go, go back, we cannot. 
for we cannot go on, we must. It will be well for us, our leaders, uh, recognize the situation instead of hesitation and timidity, which will not help them. Meet with their eyes and undaunted spirit. So, uh, 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 clearly, again, uh, Sri Aurobindo in Bande Mataram is uh, extending his critique of the British system of justice and showing how, uh, how the British uh, system of justice has totally failed. And that's why uh, there is something uh, alternative that we need. And this alternative will emerge from the soil of India. The alternative will emerge from the uh, eastern part of the world. Now, we, Rubinamar, uh, in uh, Shobhuta Sampot, writes about the uh, writes about a new sunrise from the eastern part of the world. Similarly, Aurobindo as well is talking about the emergence of a new system of justice, new system of order from the eastern part of the India, uh, from the eastern part of the world. Sorry. There are two superstitions which are driven such deep root uh, into the mind of our people that even when uh, the new spirit is the strongest, they still hold their own. One is the habit of appealing to appealing to British courts of justice, the other is the reliance upon the British executive for our protection. So again, he is clearly debunking the uh, the politics of mendicancy that was prevalent uh, in uh, Indian National Congress at that point of time. Uh, uh, we all know that Indian National Congress was divided into uh, uh, two groups of uh, uh, moderates and moderates and extremists uh, in 1905 uh, during the Swadeshi movement. And Sri Aurobindo was part of that uh, uh, part of the trip, and he always advocated uh, the idea of Purna Swaraj rather than rather than uh, ra rather than a compromised notion of selfhood under British colonial hegemony. So he is not at all focusing on a compromised nation or a compromised notion of selfhood. His focus is totally on the idea of Purna Swaraj Swadeshi. A, 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 a sovereignty of its own, a hegemony of its own. So not the colonial hegemony, rather a different sort of politics that foregrounds the uh, the new nation, foregrounds the uh, autonomy, uh, uh, autonomy of being the autonomous nation. And uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo, uh, again, uh, let me uh, tell you briefly about the context. Uh, during Shodeshi, when Sri Aurobindo is launching this critique, uh, there are two classes of nationalists uh, uh, occupying the political center of uh, uh, center of India. Uh, first of all, the bourgeois class who advocated, who predominantly advocated uh, the uh, the system of uh, moderation, the moderate system, moderate group, and also there was an emergent, uh, to quote Raymond Williams, an emergent uh, group of politicians who were uh, claiming for Purna Swaraj. Uh, before Aurobindo's claim for Purna Swaraj, uh, there was hardly any politician who claimed radically about the Purna Swaraj in Indian uh, in Indian context, and that's why in this context, Sri Aurobindo seems to be a pioneering thinker, as Shunit Sharkar points out in the Critique of Colonial India. Uh, uh, now, uh, Sri Aurobindo's Swadeshi movement and the consequent meta discursive subject. Sri Aurobindo's departures also offer insights into the emergence. An alternative civic discourse in the context of Swadeshi. The division between the moderates and the extremists, uh, as I pointed out, during the uh, Swadeshi was palpable. Sri Aurobindo vehemently criticized the medical policy of old Congress leaders. What they la lacked is the relatability and trust with the ordinary people. Sri Aurobindo's invocation of the Vedanto served to unite them. So, uh, again, uh, 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 Vedanto becomes an integral part of Sri Aurobindo's politics. And uh, Vishwanath Pratap Barma, there is a critic of Sri Aurobindo, he, he, def he says it uh, a political Vedantism. So Vedanto as a political tool of unity, unification. And he is also using the Shakta metaphor, as I pointed out, the nation as a Shakti to bring in the peasantry in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, movement. So to bring in uh, the people from different strata of the society to this movement so that they can participate, so that uh, it becomes a consulted or a united movement rather than a stray movement of uh, some bourgeois people. In, a, in an essay, the bourgeois and the samurai, Sri Aurobindo writes about the uh, uh, writes about a write a, writes about the political unification of India, and for that political unification, there has to be spiritual equality. And uh, the spiritual equality is uh, Sri 
is a uh, important contribution to this notion of equality. So there should be a spiritual equality, uh, a spiritually bound nation where uh, the 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 people are connected by a spiritual uh, a spiritual girdle, a spiritual aspect rather than uh, merely uh, the rational aspect. Spiritual is the, a spiritual goal, the spiritual community that he was trying to aim at. Uh, transcendental equality enthusiasms the spiritual well-being where the people are brought under a unifying spectrum. Empirical equality indicates the uh, Kantian uh, progress of reason and intuition every individual is capable of. We all know that uh, uh, that, in, uh, that the discourse of empiricism comes from the Enlightenment, and Enlightenment fosters. Uh, its uh, uh, views on, uh, sorry, enlightenment fosters its uh, uh, views on the idea of progress, idea of evolutionary progress, or idea of progress beyond religion, beyond uh, spirituality, and so on. But Sjorgen, though, uh, very interestingly, is using spirituality as a tool of progress, and he is uh, focusing on two notions of progress, two notions of uh, 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 equality, the spiritual and uh, the transcendental and also the empirical. The cultural paradigm of Sri Aurobindo, sorry, three notions of progress rather, uh, spiritual, transcendental and the uh, empirical. The cultural paradigm of Sri Aurobindo is both mediated by the search for reason and also an evolutionary being who can critique and go beyond this discourse of reason and instrumental rationality. So he is uh, talking about a subject who is meta discursive, who can go beyond the instrumental rationality and critique it, although remaining within it. So, remaining, you, uh, one uh, should remain within the discourse and one should also go beyond the discourse. So, Sri Aurobindo is not at all uh, totally spiritual, Sri Aurobindo is not at all totally material as well. So, uh, he is bridging spirituality and materiality by his conceptualization of a meta discursive subject who is critical even of the political discourses and he and uses spirituality as a tool of self-formation, as a tool of binding the uh, binding the whole world. Uh, his, uh, despite uh, promoting his views on equality, Sri Aurobindo uh, infuses the idea of karma, the individual action, as a means of salvation along with the code of dharma. So uh, let me uh, tell you, dharma for Sri Aurobindo is not at all uh, a religion. Sri Aurobindo translates dharma as an ethical consciousness. Sri Aurobindo always fosters an ethical consciousness that is central to uh, the notion of our being, the notion of our uh, understanding, and uh, uh, that dharma is the governing principle of life according to Sri Aurobindo. If there is no dharma, he is not at all talking about religion again, if there is no dharma, if there is no spiritual consciousness, then uh, there will not be any unity, there will not be any ethics, there will not be any perfection. So dharma is the code of conduct that he is using. Obviously this concept of dharma is independent of religion for Sri Aurobindo. It's a matter of ethical consciousness for Sri Aurobindo. The interplay between dharma and karma. Karma is, uh, is individual action and uh, uh, he supports, uh, in, in his uh, definition of karma, he supports even a revolutionary action in the act of uh, in the act of the emancipation of the nation. So karma is something that should go along with dharma. There should always be an interplay between dharma and karma uh, to uh, 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 for the transformation of the society. Uh, in fact, the core of Sri Aurobindo's political philosophy, Aurobindo's political philosophy of karma presupposes an adherence to a pre-existing ethical mode of dharma, ethical consciousness, as I pointed out. Uh, Western philosophy, Sri Aurobindo departs from the Western notion of uh, man and justice. The Cartesian paradigm, as uh, Enlightenment uh, 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 thinkers uh, will say, the Cartesian paradigm dwells on a body-mind dialectic, where the body is a repository of uh, uh, instinctive urges and the mind is a domain of consciousness. The Western pattern of thinking is dialectical, Heideggerian concept of the being and time presupposes philosophy of presence. Nietzschean will to power, as uh, Nietzsche defined it, uh, in will to power, uh, we affirm one single moment, we thus affirm not only ourselves but all existence, 
For nothing is self-sufficient, neither in us ourselves nor in him. And if our soul has trembled with happiness and sounded like a harp string, uh, just once all eternity was needed to produce uh, this one event and, uh, and so on. So uh, this uh, idea uh, of the nothing is self-sufficient, uh, that remains the an inherent lack of self-sufficiency. Uh, remains intrinsic, remains central to the Western philosophical paradigm, Western philosophical tradition. And uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo uh, also critiques the Nietzschean concept of Ubermensch. What is an Ubermensch? Uber Nietzsche defines Ubermensch as a superman who can uh, go beyond laws uh, and justice, who can create his own laws, who can uh, create uh, uh, own laws and justice, uh, offering a critique of the present norms, present values, and so on. Uh, Nietzsche uses the idea of transvaluation of values. Transvaluation of values is something that uh, overturns all uh, dominant values and creates a new value system. But in this value system, what is missing? Oh, in Nietzschean value system, what is missing is the uh, concept of dharma, concept of the ethical consciousness that the Aurobindo was uh, uh, totally focusing on. Or uh, the Aurobindo was grounding his critique of the Western philosophy on. Sorry, okay, let me have some water. Okay, fine. Sri Aurobindo's view of man. Uh, uh, science, uh, uh, as Sri Aurobindo points out, uh, uh, science at its limit, even in physical science, is compelled to perceive in the uh, end of the infinite, the universal, or the spirit, the divine intelligence, and the will in the material universe. Still more easily must this be the end with the psychic sciences, which deal with the operations. Of higher and subtler planes and powers of our being and come into contact with the being and the phenomena of the worlds behind which are unseen, not sensible, our uh, uh, physical organs, but, but as fashionable by the subtle mind uh, and senses. Art leads to same end, the aesthetic, the human being intensely preoccupied with nature through aesthetic emotion must be in the, uh, uh, must be in the end uh, arrive. Uh, at the spiritual emotion and perceive not only the infinite life but the infinite present within us. So uh, the human being should realize the infinite present, the uh, the spiritual aspect within us, uh, uh, within uh, within uh, the soul. It's not it, the individual is not a sum total of material uh, material urges or material emotions, but also there is something intrinsically spiritual about the individual. Uh, in second point is his view of man is very inclusive as uh, uh, in Aurobindonian paradigm uh, it's called the integral idea of being. Unlike the Western philosophy, Sri Aurobindo divides human being into several layers of consciousness. The uh, psychological map of man for Sri Aurobindo is horizontal rather than vertical. It's horizontal map. He divides man into distinct layers of consciousness, psychic, vital, and physical. Different views of man, the vital being, what is the vital being? The outer vital consciousness, the uh, life force contains the desires, feelings, instincts, impulses, passions, ambitions of the human being. The external urges, the urges, the emotion that drives us is the vital aspect of human being. And it relates to uh, Bagza, Ori Bagza's concept of the Ilan vital. The mental being is about the human, uh, human intelligence. It's an anticipatory con consciousness which does not give us an access to the essential knowledge. It's related to the human intelligence. It measures, cuts out from an individual whole and treats them as separate integrals. Uh, the man, uh, the main psychic being is the inmost physical, vital, uh, uh, inner physical. Okay, let me define the psychic being. Psychic being is, uh, uh, is the jivatma. The Sri Aurobindo talks about psychic being as the jivatma that uh, it remains within uh, the mind of the individual and it governs the other aspects of being, the vital being and the mental being. Psychic is the inner spiritual core of man that is capable of transmuting or capable of governing the vital being and the mental being, capable of governing the intelligence and the emotion. So psychic is playing the role of an instrument that is channelizing through uh, the vital being and the mental being. So this consciousness, uh, as I talked about the idea of dharma, 
this uh, psychic being is actually the dharma, the ethical consciousness that she orbits the pearls out. This ethical consciousness, uh, ethical consciousness shapes the vital and the mental being, and if there is a, a transformation in the ethical consciousness, a transformation in the psychic, then uh, the vital being and the mental being are also transformed. So let me not get into this uh, philosophical details of theorgizm because. Uh, these are very intricate and uh, this uh, uh, demands uh, different uh, uh, different presentations. And uh, just uh, let me tell you about the interplay of the vital uh, psychic and the mental forms informs the individual spirit, while the vital deals with the exuberant emotions and passions, the mental deals with the human intelligence. There is also a psychic layer to individual consciousness, which is the inmost being. The psychic is the divine nucleus, the ethical consciousness which transmute and purifies the other aspects of being, as I talked about. Uh, Sri Aurobindo's revolutionary lineage, uh, despite his philosophical assumptions, Sri Aurobindo is perhaps one of the pioneering thinkers to endorse his views on Purna Swaraj. He forms a coherent body of political thoughts in Bande Matra in order to achieve the goal of complete freedom and independence. As I pointed out, he was asking for Purna Swaraj. Uh, he advocates the rise of an Indian proletariat. Spirituality is key to the self-fashioning of this Indian proletariat. His politics is spiritually bound. He propounds the concept of nation soul, where the nation is not merely a, a political entity, uh, sorry, uh, and neither it's an imagined community, as Benedict Anderson pointed out, uh, uh, as Benedict Anderson pointed out, rather it's a spiritually unifying factor that regulates and binds also. He is conceptualizing nation as a spiritual community, uh, not as an imagined community. The spirituality is the only truth he is recurrently focusing on, recurrently thrusting on. Uh, he waged war against the British government. His politics of resistance, his links with different revolutionary organizations led him to his arrest in 1908. Uh, Karakahini, Tales from Prison Life. Karakahini was written in 1910. He calls the British prison as ashram. He recounts his experience of arrest and how he was arrested without a body warrant. He was convicted under the charge of murder. And he recounts, uh, as uh, we talked about, uh, my solitary cell uh, was nine feet long and five feet in width. Uh, it had no windows. In front of strong iron bars, this cage was appointed my abode. Outside was a small courtyard, a stony ground with high brick walls with a small wooden door. So uh, this was the spatial structure of his, uh, uh, of his prison. And within this, uh, within this, uh, within this kuturi, in, uh, in Bengali we say that, it, uh, within this uh, kuturi-like uh, place, Sri Aurobindo was placed in. Uh, and he had to spend 12 months within this uh, kuturi-like state. So it's really, uh, uh, it's quite easily understandable how difficult it was for him to live in this uh, uh, space for 12 months, nine feet long and five feet in width. So it's absolutely miserable. It's it's like a veritable hell. But uh, how this hell become uh, a mode of self transformation? I will show. Uh, topography of the prison, uh, uh, and Sri Aurobindo read the topography of the prison. There were six contiguous rooms like that in prison for uh, 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 their only point of contact with the outside world was restricted to the eyes of the sentry. So uh, the, uh, the sentry was uh, 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 the uh, the sentry was the only agent who could uh, who could go uh, who could play the role of an exposure to the outside world. So it's basically, as I point out, uh, it's basically the panoptical surveillance, as Foucault uh, um, uh, points out in Discipline and Punish. That, uh, the idea of panopticon is operating here. Only the sentry was uh, the means through which one can go outside. So it's a, it's a state of complete self alienation, as uh, I uh, show in my uh, next slide. Uh, he narrates how exacting and laborious the space of prison was. The world was free from all caste restriction beyond discrimination in the prison cell itself in the acts of abduction. During my stay, as Sri Aurobindo recounts, during my stay in Alipur jail, I ate, lived, and went through the same hardship and enjoyed the same privileges with other convicts. My fellow nationalists, potters, iron mongers, 
dogs and babdis. He confesses how the sense of socialism and unity still lead to him uh, as a, a nationwide solidarity. That was his Jibon Goto. So uh, clearly, Sri Aurobindo was imagining in Bonde Mataram, was imagining a concept of one nation, uh, was imagining a concept of uh, a, a unifying nation that was not being fulfilled in the political term. But uh, in prison, he finds a community, a communitarian identity which is uh, meeting with other people from other professions. So uh, in a way, he defines, despite the panoptical surveillance, of the colonial prison system, he defi defines how this space was quite inclusive, how this space was uh, uh, opening up a new dimension of being, a new di dimension of socialism uh, that that was uh, absent in the Indian political discourse, that was absent in the Indian political field. So uh, it also debunks all the hierarchy. It also reduces individual to a same level, to a same space. To a, a same uh, form of living, and thereby it dismantles all the present hierarchies that the Indian political system was inherently stratified with. So uh, this is something interesting, and this way of uh, uh, presenting the prison as uh, as a space of uh, finding a community is something very interesting about your window, and it reminds us uh, the concept of jahaji bhai, as Hamid uh, Bissar talked about uh, in this lecture. Uh, in this lecture series uh, organized by Calcutta Comparative, and he is also talking about the same kind of community that is being developed, that is being developed uh, uh, between uh, uh, different uh, between different uh, people from different profession in the prison. He confesses how this sense of socialism and unity instilled into him a sense of nationwide solidarity. He recounts how, from time to time, police would bring forward uh, witnesses of different kinds color, shape, and enact the uh, uh, and enact the, the first of an identification parade. The topography of the prison continued. He recounts how he developed the unity and oneness with the living and non-living beings in the prison. The high world, uh, uh, those iron bars, uh, as I quote, the high world, the iron bars, the white world, the windy tree shining in sunlight, it seemed the commonplace objects were not unconscious at all. The pull of emotion overpowered the whole body and the mind. A spring of love for all creatures gushed from the wind. So the philosophization of what Sri Aurobindo is doing is basically the philosophization of prison. In Sri Aurobindo, in Karaka, in Sri Aurobindo, uh, philosophizes the concept of prison. It paves way for its spiritual enlightenment. It paves way also uh, 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 for an encounter with uh, 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 for an encounter with the living uh, uh, for the non-living beings for the non-living aspect non-living. Uh, 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 for the uh, for the non-living uh, creatures of the prison, so this uh, it, it not only uh, not only uh, uh, talks about a, a not not only talks about a unity between the uh, uh, between different profession between different people, but also uh, uh, and it opens up a space for encounter between the uh, living and the non-living, between the human and the non-human. So the it, it uh, opens up a space of uh, a space that's beyond the human world. So this cosmic unity that he finds in the prison seems to uh, anchor his politics in the Pondicherry phase. Uh, I I have argued in my uh, chapter that this cosmic unity that he finds uh, in uh, the prison the, between the living and the non-living uh, that anchors his politics in the Pondicherry phase is nationalist discourse was predominantly anthropocentric. It's predominantly based on the view of man, but uh, Indian philosophy, uh, as uh, uh, we delve deeper into Mahabharata or uh, uh, any uh, other Indian text, it, it specifically denotes that there is a vast presence of non-human as well in Mahabharata or Ramayana or Indian texts. So Indian text always talks about the uh, unity of the self and the other, the living and the non-living. So this. Uh, and Sri Aurobindo in uh, Karakai is actually using this Indian context of uh, uh, interface, drawing an interface between the living and the non-living. Uh, realization of the development of a spiritually bound community that he envisaged in the political dream of Bhendra Mataram. The communitarian ethic of the prison mentioned means bringing to his corporeal being and also Sri Aurobindo's dream of a spiritually bound community was largely anthropocentric. Uh, 
Anthropocentric in in this Karakaini, uh, um, he departs from this anthropocentric view of nation. In prison, he finds an interface between the human and the non-human, the living and the non-living being. The aim of the pre uh, prison was the cure of the body, overcoming the laws of the physics and the freedom of inner life. So the uh, the victory over the body, victory over the material, uh, all the remaining within the material. This is the central thesis of Sri Aurobindo. This is the central philosophy of Sri Aurobindo's uh, uh, corporeality, Sri Aurobindo's being. Body in prison space and prison in the body. Uh, one can argue after Foucault and Julia Kristeva how the body is objectified in the panopticon surveillance of the prison space. The object is neither the subject and object, always on the border. It's always collapsing the border of the subject and object, as Christopher defines it. Sri Aurobindo's accounts also transcribes the dehumanizing and objectifying gaze of the colonial prison system, which leads to a supreme form of alienation, reducing him to a gaze of critical scrutiny. In the, puni uh, the punitive society, Foucault examines concept of the penal, the carceral, and the coercive. And here, uh, all three aspects are present, the penal mode, the carceral mode, and the coercive mode. But Sri Aurobindo is actually uh, refusing to this uh, uh, concept of penal gaze, carceral gaze, and coercive gaze, and he is offering a reverse gaze to his writing. And also, as uh, uh, recent, very recently, uh, 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 Karan M. Monin, in a recent book, uh, 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 on person, space, uh, prisoners, and animals draws an interface between the human and the non-human in the prison topography and how it leads to the development of a transhuman species. And the same thing is happening in Sri Aurobindo's text as well. There is uh, the border between the human and the non-human collapses and a new subject emerges, a new evolutionary subject emerges who has relationship with the non-human world as well. It's not about the a human world only. The the subject that Sri Aurobindo conceptualizes in uh, uh, Karakaini shares an intrinsic relationship with the non-human, with the non-living world as well. Uh, the prison as a pilgrimage. Sri Aurobindo redeploys the meaning of the prison. He uses uh, he uses a, it as a metaphor of human bondage and shows how the striving for liberty remains intrinsic to it. The definition of prison as an ashrama or a pilgrimage. Uh, also has a spiritual connotations. Rabindranath, in his travel writings, uses the concept of tirtho or pilgrimage as a means of self-discovery. Uh, Rabindranath calls Brahman tirtho. That means uh, in a tirtho, uh, you, you, uh, you find a different kind of self-discovery. You have a different sort of spiritual orientation. You have a different sort of spiritual sublimation. And uh, uh, in Rabindranath's uh, idea of travel, this uh, concept of uh, Tirtho comes very recurrently. That concept of travel uh, and self-discovery comes very recurrently. It's a mode of becoming where the self and the other are united. Uh, in Sri Aurobindo's uh, uh, concept of the prison, sorry for the um, uh, printing, uh, sorry for the typological error, uh, 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 Sri Aurobindo's uh, concept of the prison as well one finds a similar analogy. The meanings of the carceral space and the corporeal being are sublimated to an abstract unified entity. The body emerges as a transcorporeal being going beyond the dichotomy of the body and mind. The body-mind dichotomy that Western philosophy totally uh, was totally focused on uh, is totally uh, subverted in uh, in Karakahini, and a new being emerges, a new transcorporeal evolutionary being emerges. Uh, uh, who can? Uh, uh, who can transform the society, who can transform the world, who can transform, who can change the mindset of the world about the non-living being, about the uh, about the consciousness about of the other objects. Uh, uh, recently in consciousness studies, uh, we uh, get a term like creature consciousness, and Sri Aurobindo in Tales from Prison Life uh, anticipates this idea of creature consciousness uh, while he shows that uh, the how the consciousness was uh, intrinsic to the non-human objects as well, or uh, uh, non-human uh, beings as well, or the animals as well, or the creatures as well. All right. Uh, now, uh, the narrative and the subversion in Karakhani. Sri Aurobindo offers a retrospective view of prison after getting released from the prison. Uh, in uh, so, it, very interestingly, uh, we have to keep in mind that Karakhani is a memoir. He is writing it 
in a retrospective account. His retrospective approach seems to be largely uh, political with his ideological and legal views of memory. So he uses memory very politically. The, uh, the way he uses memory is playing uh, a significant role in shaping his poetics. I, I, I would, um, uh, if I had time, I would have liked to argue how the role of memory in Karakani plays an intrinsic role, but that's not the focus of my uh, presentation today. I'm just briefly mentioning it that how Freud, uh, how the Freudian idea of relativeness of memory is acting as a tool of uh, ultimate, a tool of subversion in uh, uh, Karakani, and he promotes the possibility of psychic realization even in prison. Uh, even in the presence of colonial gaze. So this psychic realization, uh, in a way, offers a counter gaze to the colonial gaze of surveillance that is operating in the prison. Karakaini also redefines the spatial compartmentalization between the inner and the uh, outer binary. The political prison and its dis uh, description we discussed, the boundaries led into a spiritual growth, and the spirituality in turn redefines this prison. prison as an ashrama or a pilgrimage. Uh, as Parthi Chattati defines uh, that uh, uh, how Indian uh, nationalists were influenced by the uh, inner and the outer binary, uh, where the inner was predominantly, uh, predominantly the spiritual domain and the outer was totally the political domain. And uh, Sri Aurobindo is reverting or is uh, sub uh, reverting back to the binary and totally subverting it. And he is showing, uh, showing how the inner and the outer can interplay like uh, the political and the spiritual. So there is no dichotomy in Sri Aurobindo. There is only a sense of dismantling and going beyond the category, the going beyond the Western uh, category. Right. So uh, the quest for a new being, uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo thus uh, recalibrates the meaning of the prison according to the epistemology of a transcorporeal and trans transcendental being. His autonomy of selfhood, despite the relentless coercion of the colonial machinery, remains undefeated. The narrative systematically subverts and renegotiates the binaries between the spiritual and the political, the inner and the outer. It forges the possibility of developing a kinship between the human and the non-human. The playfulness of memory used in the narrative quite deliberately reverses the ideological binaries of the colonial biopolitics. As I talked about at length about this, uh, the text also gives way to the rise of a new political subject with a spiritual core. Uh, this quest speaks of his uh, quest for an ethicalized subjectivity that becomes central to his politics in the Pondicherry, as I mentioned before. Uh, and from writing in the Pondicherry phase, it becomes evident how Sri Aurobindo continues uh, with his political ideas in a different spiritual mode. So, in Pondicherry phase, uh, there are uh, and speculations about Sri Aurobindo's uh, withdrawal from politics in the Pondicherry phase, but uh, uh, that's uh, not very uh, correct in my opinion. And uh, Sri Aurobindo uh, uh, was very much into politics even in the Pondicherry phase, but in a different, in a different fashion. He was not acting as a revolutionary, but he was writing about politics in his letters, in his uh, uh, entries, in, uh, uh, in his uh, diary entries. Uh, it's very much evident that how he was right uh, very much uh, aware of the contemporary politics and how he was writing at length about them recurrently about them so uh, this view of uh, uh, reading sri aurobindo uh, uh, sri aurobindo stages as a political space and spiritual space seems to be uh, seems to be uh, very wrong in, in my opinion and, uh, 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 and sri aurobindo was uh, uh, very much associated with his politics even in the community However, his political orientation changed. He was not looking about this revolutionary transformation of the society. Rather, he was looking for a new being who can evolve, who can evolve uh, towards uh, a new future. The revolutionary being is capable of changing the society, changing the world order. Uh, well, let me uh, tell you very briefly about this quest for the revolutionary being very intensive to his dramatic works. Very few of us know that Sri Aurobindo was also a dramatist. So I, I, I'm, I am fortunate to work on his plays. And, uh, and this quest for evolutionary being remains central to his dramatic work. If we, uh, if we read his plays, uh, we find how this concept of uh, evolution 
his notion of the spirit, uh, a spiritual leader by seems to be a departure from the rule of politics and his power nor his dire being not in a sense So uh, he is uh, basically uh, cutting from the metaphysics of prison and he is trying to locate an alternative within the within the, uh, within the mind of the individual that is not concerned with the uh, Western aspect of uh, being a Western idea of knowledge, but the Western test of uh, unconscious at the point of the mouth. Rather, he is talking about the I think we have network issue. Shubhamta, are you in the meeting? This is also today. This is this was the presentation, and thank you so much for listening. And pardon me that I had problems with my internet connection. I had to begin anew. And thank you for the comparison for this great opportunity. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, Shubhamda, can you hear me? Uh, Shubhamda, can you hear me? Uh, Shall I remove the PPT? Shubhamda is here. Uh, can you hear? Uh, I, I think Shubhamda is on call with Jim. It's okay, he's visible too. Okay, Shubhamda, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Show the net. Go the art culture to slow. I think now it is fine. Okay, so we can start the Q and A session. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shubhamda, for your insightful and wonderful lecture on uh, Sri Aurobindo and his quest for nation, his idea of spirituality, on his idea uh, for a pure Swaraj and uh, a spiritually bound nation. And uh, now I uh, open this session for questions and I would request our participants on YouTube for to post their questions. And uh, Pratimta, could you please show us the questions on you from YouTube? Yes. So the first question is from uh, Shuparna. Yes. Uh, Dada, you, you can also see it on your screen. Can we relate Sri Aurobindo's philosophy of dharma and karma with Swami Vivekananda's concept of karma yoga? Uh, definitely, Shubhana, um, absolutely. Uh, Dada, you are not audible. Shubhanta, you are not yeah. audible. Uh, can you please uh, switch off your camera so that we can hear you? Uh, Shubhamta, will you please switch off your camera? Uh, you are not audible. Okay, I think he will rejoin. Yeah. Sometimes this network issues.
Uh, has he rejoined, or should I uh, should I call him once? No, no. Uh, no. One, one this minute. Is, 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 is. Excuse me. Is it, sir? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Now it's better. Network is better. Okay. Yes. Uh, Shukarna, absolutely. Uh, Sri Aurobindo's philosophy of dharma and karma with Swami uh, Vivekananda's concept of karma jogi. Obviously, as uh, Sri Aurobindo also writes about karma jogi in 1909, and in karma jogi he uh, talks about uh, a, a spiritual being as well as uh, as well as a physically strong individual. So uh, he is talking about the uh, unification of the physicality and spirituality. As Swami Vivekananda was also talking about, was also talking about as and there is a famous quote of Swami Vivekananda, the Gita part of a football khala And that age, uh, uh, playing football is better than reading, uh, reading Gita. So uh, this, uh, why why uh, he is uh, saying this? Just because he wanted to have a bolstered nation, physically bolstered, physically fortified nation, as well as uh, that physically fortified nation should be governed by a spiritual consciousness, a spiritual uh, view of the world. So, yes, obviously, uh, Sri Aurobindo uh, and Swami Vivekananda follow the same tradition, definitely. Super. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dada. Now, the next question is from Protim Dash. Uh, Shuparna, can you uh, mute Shubhamda, please? Mm -hmm. I mean, good. Okay. Thank you, sir. My question is about Sri Aurobindo model of karma, which was more flexible. He observed that nature is not rigid uh, or revengeful, but stable and liberal in her application of law. In this uh, idea, in this, uh, show the next part, in this idea of karma had a connection with the nationalistic consciousness of the time but was also quite different in its approach from the ideas of other thinkers. What is your take about that? Uh, Dada, please unmute yourself. Yes. Can you uh, specify anyone? So uh, I pointed out his difference with the uh, Western thinkers. Uh, in Indian uh, spiritual tradition, he was very much part of that. He was very much like Vivekananda, uh, uh, he was very much like Rabindranath Tagore, but uh, there is an essential difference uh, uh, from Tagore or Gandhi in Sri Aurobindo. Uh, while uh, Rabindranath uh, Tagore and Gandhi were talking about Ahim Shoraj uh, or uh, the lack of violence in uh, their idea of the nation, Sri Aurobindo endorsed the notion of conditional violence. That means if you have to achieve freedom, if, if you have to act for that, it's justified. So, uh, as um, uh, uh, as I, uh, I I would love to refer to Walter Benjamin here, Walter Benjamin's critical violence, and where he uses the uh, idea of messianic violence. And Sri Aurobindo is also talking about the messianic or the divine violence. That if you are committed to the goal of the nation's emancipation, you can use violence as a tool. You can use violence as a as a mode of self transformation. So violence is not at all uh, not at all totally uh, uh, totally what should I say? It's not at all totally rejected in Sri Aurobindo's philosophy. Violence is there, but uh, in Rabindranath and um, uh, in Gandhi, you don't find the space of violence. But they also talk about the same kind of. Uh, uh, Shomaj building, as Rabindranath's idea of Shomaj or uh, uh, Gandhi's idea of uh, 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 social mobilization, uh, we find a resonance of Sri Aurobindo. So, this is how uh, we can see the difference of Sri Aurobindo from other Indian nationalist thinkers. Obviously, Rabindranath cannot be called a nationalist thinker, but Rabindranath was part of the tradition of spirituality. Uh, that was emerging uh, in the second half, uh, or not uh, not second half, uh, that is emerging in the first half of the uh, 20th century. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, uh, 
Shubhamda, you have to mute yourself. Other words, other way. Yeah. So we have another question from Pratim Das. Also, Rabindranath's concept of Tirtho or self discovery was closely associated with the idea of Indianization and imagining a greater India. I'm curious to know uh, does this introspection was a part of a uh, project of imagining greater India or just liberation from the material world? I'm just curious about it. Thank you, sir. If you would like to answer this question. Definitely. Yes, obviously, he was imagining a greater India and uh, as, as you remember, he was uh, recurrently delving deeper into the ancient Indian past where all, all were united. And he is uh, using the concept of Itihasha, a different notion of world history. And, uh, in, and in this world history concept, there are different aspects that, that intermingle. So this concept of Itihasha where uh, you find the presence of Mughals, you find the presence of Christians, you find the presence of all Aryans, all, everyone who visited India. So obviously, uh, the uh, Pegas' presence of, uh, uh, or Pegas' idea of Tirtho or pilgrimage is very much inclusive as he was uh, totally focusing on an integral transformation of India uh, with an inherent spiritual unity and an inherent quest for uh, transformation where the self and the other can be united. So uh, when you go out, that means uh, you uh, you go out of yourself and you know the other. And knowing the other becomes the, the easiest way to assimilate with the other. So this idea of knowing and uh, assimilating with the other, mingling with the other, relations in the sociologists and Tagore's philosophy, and uh, both of them are talking about this concept of unification, this concept of uh, unity, or spiritual and political unity. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dada. Yes, yes. We will just wait a minute. Participants, you can post your questions on the comment box on YouTube. Yes. So we have our next question from Aratrika Ganguly. Uh, she has asked, Sri Aurobindo's magnum opus, Shravitri, reflects poetry as Vihan Mantra. Does this concept reflect in his Karakahini as well? Uh, Shubhamta, you have to uh, unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I won't say that it's reflected very much in Karakahini, but uh, yes, he gets the idea of spiritual consciousness from Karakahini, and later he develops it through uh, different uh, works like the Light Divine or like uh, let's say uh, the uh, the Integral Yoga, synthesis of yoga, and, he, and later find the concept of Shabitri much more. Now the idea of Shabitri much more in Light Divine or in uh, synthesis of yoga, and he started writing Shabitri in 1914. So yes, you can say that the idea of spiritual consciousness that is uh, that, that is the operative link in Savitri uh, gets reflected in Karatayani. But I won't say that uh, it in any way anticipates Karatayani. Yes, he gets the spiritual consciousness from here, but uh, uh, is the spiritual consciousness that leads to Savitri is much more in the life divine or in the synthesis of yoga. Uh, thank you so much. We have another question from uh, Rangna Thakur. He has asked, has Aurobindo been marginalized in the contemporary discourse of political, uh, polit Indian politics, I think he has asked. Okay, so it's a uh, broad it's, area. Uh, Aurobindo uh, obviously is a marginal figure in academia and politics. And uh, very unfortunately, Sri Aurobindo is appropriated uh, in a very wrong way in the contemporary political discourse. There are uh, different political parties who are appropriate in Sri Aurobindo as something else. But uh, that is uh, uh, the unfortunate part of it. So um, I won't say that uh, Sri Aurobindo has been read very, uh, uh, very deeply by any of the political parties that uh, those who are trying to appropriate him. So that's all. Uh, yes, 
he remains marginal figure in academia and also in political discourse of India. Definitely. Yes. Uh, thank you. He has yeah. another question. Uh, what's your take on Gandhi and Aurobindo relations? Okay, this is taking a political turn. So, uh, may I know the question? What is your take on Gandhi or As I talked about that Gandhi or relations, uh, there is a difference in Gandhi and Aurobindo's political approach. And uh, uh, yes, Gandhi or relation uh, needs um, uh, a, a curious deliberation. And I have not, but I, but frankly speaking, I haven't got into the nuances of Gandhi or relations because Gandhi emerges much later in the Indian political context. And Sri Aurobindo was already there in Pondicherry then. Uh, and uh, that's all. Uh, um, Sri Aurobindo appreciated Gandhi's idea of Shukta Groh. And, uh, but Sri Aurobindo initially uh, committed to the idea of uh, uh, revolutionary violence if needed, if, the, if, the, if there is revolution, a necessity of revolutionary violence, one can uh, endorse revolutionary violence. Uh, that's all. Uh, but uh, I don't think I can uh, tell you uh, quite much about that. The relationship between Gandhi and Aurobindo. That's it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shubhamda. Do you have any more question? No, we don't. I think. Okay, so uh, thank you, Subhamda, for this insightful and engaging lecture. Now, I would request Shubhamda to give to deliver the vote of thanks. Shubhamda, on behalf of the uh, Calcutta Comparatives 1919 and its members, I would like to convey our hearty thanks to Shubham Dattoda for this excellent discussion on Sri Aurobindo's Kara Kahini. A big thank you to you for sharing your ideas and views on this. Uh, I would like to express our gratitude to you for responding to us and coming to our forum. We are really inspired by, uh, inspired by your great words. Thank you to all of our audience uh, on YouTube for being with us today. Here we officially conclude this session. Uh, before concluding, we have a big announcement to make. On 1st February, we are hosting a session with Professor Homi K. Bhava. Please subscribe to our channel if you don't want to miss our upcoming lectures. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you again you for inviting me for this lecture. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, pleasure was ours. It is our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much. A very good night to everyone.